Hey, welcome to Christ Culture and Coffee. Today, I'm your host, Robbie Lashua, and I'm here with a great special guest, Tom Gilson. Uh, Tom is the senior editor with The Stream. He's the author or editor of six books, including his most recent book that I have right here, Too Good to Be False, How Jesus' Incomparable Character Reveals His Reality. Uh, I love this book. You need to get it. We'll have links in the show notes and everything, but you should check it out. Uh, Tom is also the chief editor of the anthology True Reason, uh, Christian Responses to the Challenge of Atheism, and he's also the author of a book that I love called Critical Conversations, A Christian Parent's Guide to Discussing Homosexuality with Teens. Um, You need to also check out his blog, uh, Thinking Christian. He's been blogging since, get ready for this, 2004. Talk about a pioneer in the wave of blogging. Uh, Tom lives near Dayton, Ohio with his wife, Sarah. He has a a bachelor's of music and music education from Michigan State University, an MS in organizational psychology from the University of Central Florida. And this is the best part. When he is not writing, he loves drinking coffee. There we go. Drinking coffee. He loves canoeing, walking in the woods, and playing his trombone. So, Tom Gilson, hey, thanks so much for being with us today on Christ, Culture, and Coffee. We're glad that you're here. Well, thank you. It's it's fun to be here. Thanks, Robbie. Yeah. So, you love drinking coffee. And again, coffee is kind of an important part of our show. We always start every episode with a coffee tip, uh, whether it's about roasting beans or or different kinds of drinks you can make or even what you can do with coffee grounds. Uh, So, when we have guests on, we like to ask them about their preferences for coffee. So, Tom, what types of coffee do you like? What kind of drinks do you usually go to? I go for dark roasts, and I'm. uh, Recent, uh, recently got, gone for Black Rifle. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's good coffee. It is and good Can coffee. I tell you a story? Yeah, absolutely. This is, it's kind of funny. I was meeting a new friend, someone that actually Mark Middleberg was a mutual friend. He said, you need to meet this guy, Brad. He's pastoring a church near where you live. And, and so we got together and we were talking. We we're talking about different things. I'd never been to his church. And at one point, I said, and I really like coffee. And he said, you like coffee? you got to come to our church. I thought, that is the strangest recruit I've ever heard. <laughs> but he's one of my very best friends now, anyway. Oh, so. <laughs> that's awesome. That's a pretty good reason to go to church. It is. And are you going to that church? <laughs> no, we're, we're oh, not okay. close enough. So the coffee yet. didn't trick you. It didn't get you no, in. No, but. but I still I actually go to a men's group that meets here. Um, early Thursday mornings. And, oh, that's great. Uh, wishing that we could do it physically. We're, we're doing it virtually now. Okay. This group. That's great. Well, yeah. I, yeah. I, like you, Black Rifle Coffee, my friend just turned me on to that. He gave me a, a free bag of theirs like a month ago. It's such good mm-hmm. coffee. I really like that company too yeah. and what they're doing with veterans and everything. That's That's yeah. great. Yeah, I love it. Well, hey, I've met you uh, a couple of times, I think. I went to two Defend the Faith conferences in New Orleans probably like five years ago, six years ago, somewhere around there. Uh, and that was the first time, actually, I was exposed to you and what you do and also to, to Dr. Tim McGrew and what he's doing. And uh, you guys uh, did a really cool thing one night. You said uh, to everybody in the conference, hey, if any of you want to come to our, our apartment you know, on campus here after tonight's stuff, come and hang out, have some coffee with us, ask questions. And so actually mm-hmm. me and my co-host, Tyler, uh, we got to come and hang out with you guys and talk yeah. with you about life and it was just an enjoyable time i really appreciated that you guys would open up your your time to us like that well you know we love doing that i i don't know what's going to happen i haven't heard the, how the conference is going to be run this next january mm. but the best thing about that new orleans defend conference is the is the fellowship mm-hmm. and what i have learned is that people who like apologetics are lonely <laughs> they need fellowship and yeah. uh, it's it's rare to be it's rare when someone can say yeah i've got this good friend in church who loves it as much as i do it's it's yes. not common and and they need the fellowship Yeah, I totally agree with that. So really appreciate Uh you guys doing that. And hopefully the conference goes on this year. I I love it, too, because it's not like there's not like a thousand people there. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And and I know they'd probably love to grow to that, but I like it because it's small. And then I can get to talk to people like yourself or Dr. McGrew or Dr. Habermas. So it's a it's a great conference. Mm -hmm. Plus, the food down there is amazing. So you can't beat it. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Well, Tom, you just don't get me on that. I know. (laughs) 
well, hey, you just came out with this new book, and I'm excited about it because I heard um, kind of the preliminary arguments for this book uh, at the conference a few years ago, uh, and I've actually taught those ideas to people, even to junior high students, because it's it's an argument they can remember for the validity mm-hmm. of the New Testament, for why Jesus must be who the disciples said he was. Uh, so I've already uh, gained so much insight from it, but your new book goes way more into detail on these yeah. types of arguments. And uh, I'm, I'm excited to kind of talk through what this book is about today. So um, in the intro of your book, you say that this kind of isn't your everyday Bible study method book. Right. Uh, and you right. yourself have come away uh, with some new insights from this. You, you promise other people that will come away kind of looking at Jesus from a different angle. So mm-hmm. what, what do you mean when you say that it's not the everyday Bible study method that people are kind of used to? Yeah, it really is different because, and you know, I've been a Christian for 40 plus years now, and uh, what you do and what I've done my whole life, what I've studied, what I've read other people do, when you're studying the Gospels especially, is you look at what Jesus said and what Jesus did. Mm. Well, I asked a different question. What did he not say? What did he not do? What are some things specifically that you would expect someone who was a, a great leader or a religious founder, or some someone else who, who made an impact. What do they do? Mm-hmm. And and did Jesus do the same thing they did? Did he do uh, what um, the prophets did, or was he different? Mm-hmm. And the more I studied it, the more I thought, oh, he is extraordinary. He stands out, and <clears throat> and he's different in ways that are surprising. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know reviewers, including people like Sean McDowell and Frank Turek, have said, this is surprising mm-hmm. discoveries. Um, but it's it, but it's good. It just shows more and more how extraordinary he is. Yeah, well, and I, re- through reading the book, it's been awesome just to see how unique Jesus is. And one of the things I love that you talk about is we're all too familiar with him to see yeah. how extraordinary he is, right? And I think for Western culture, e- even non-Christians, there's just so much familiarity with Jesus and kind of the things he did that it becomes old hat. And until you take a new approach like you did and you compare him with other religious leaders or political leaders, uh, you can't see or you, you don't see uh, some of these kind of uh, jaw-dropping uh, things that he did do or he didn't do. Um, right. And yeah, yeah. I loved that method that you took. Is Okay, what didn't he say? What would you expect him to say that he mm-hmm. he kind of doesn't? So in, yeah. ri- in writing this book, um, who who's the target audience with this? Who, who are you going for? Who do you want to grab this book and digest it and, and understand yeah. the concepts? Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, it's, it's written primarily for church people. Uh, people. Uh, I would love to see group leaders pick it up and say, we can talk about this together. There's a bio, uh, a study guide in the back mm-hmm. that's just open it up and you're ready to go with, with discussion questions if you've read the book. But the idea is it really to, to catch people who have gotten used to Jesus okay, and and to help them see him from another perspective and to, and to grow in their love for him and, and worship. Which has been happening, uh, based on the reviews and and endorsements I've been seeing, that people would would want to follow him more, but also because there's a section in there, a significant section where I talk about how Jesus' extraordinary character makes it impossible that he was just some legendary invention. Mm-hmm. It's it's for skeptics and it's for anyone who's wondering, okay, can I really trust whether this is true? Mm-hmm. So it covers a it covers a broader range than I expected, actually, because uh, Craig Evans, when he endorsed it, he said that it was obviously written for the general public, but the professionals could get a lot out of it, too. Yeah, wow, that's awesome. But, yeah, that was not what I expected. Hmm. Well, that's, I mean, and honestly, you're you're a writer. You are a professional yeah. writer. You've been writing for a long time, and you're good at it. And I always think that it's a sign of a, a good writer to be able to explain deep concepts 
in everyday language that people can grasp. And that's what I find in this book. It's so refreshing. And even in the foreword, I think, by Corey Miller, he says you can read through it really fast because it's an easy read, but don't because you need mm-hmm. to chew on these concepts and you need to slow down and yeah. to contemplate what's there. But um, I, I've always enjoyed uh, your writing, and this book uh, okay. goes right along with, with your past stuff on being readable but also very, very uh, thought-provoking. So I, I'm thankful for that. I, sometimes, you know, oh. there's people who write at this high level that about 10 people buy the book and read. <laughs> and I think if we're gonna, <laughs> if we're gonna yeah. impact the church for Jesus, we need to take these concepts and, and write them in a palatable way for, for the, the normal church yeah. goer. So, and that's, I, so I love books like this that have depth, but also are understandable. So I really appreciate what you've done there. So um, again, it's such a, I've read a ton of apologetics books in, in my life, right? Like this is what I do. And so uh, you read a lot of the arguments for uh, New Testament reliability. You read a lot of arguments for uh, God's existence um, and for the miracles of Jesus. This book is very, very, very different <laughs> from the norm right. and it in is. a good yeah. way. Uh, it's just, mm-hmm. it's so refreshing to read. And so I think that as our readers will go through it, they're going to find a lot of surprises about stuff that you're not going to find in other apologetics books because some of this is um, either really new or, like you say, it's from really, really old books that we haven't read in a few centuries (laughs) that you're kind of reviving. And so when you were studying this and you were writing this book, did you run into any big surprises uh, that that kind of shocked you? Oh, my goodness, yeah. And um, and and it's, it's a blast. The, my favorite thing in the Bible is when I discover something that just surprises me. Mm. Um, and, and I ran into it a lot with, with this with Jesus. Um, I'll start with one that's from the the second chapter of the book, the first one, chapter after the intro, which is discovering that Jesus, with all his extraordinary power, never used it for his own benefit. Mm. And there is something there that is unmatched in all of history and all of literature. As far as I've been able to find, no one has ever obviously lived a life as self-sacrificial as his. And I don't believe for, for all I've been able to find, there's anyone's even imagined a character mm. who comes anywhere close to being as self-sacrificial as he was when he had so much power. Mm. Yeah. When the devil came to him and said, command these stones to to become bread, and Jesus was hungry, he could have. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he could have. He could have, but he he only used his extraordinary power for others. Mm-hmm. So other-centered. Is that not amazing? It Can you imagine amazing. being that other-centered yourself? I can't. I, I literally can't imagine it, <laughs> because uh, I wouldn't be, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, having that immense power, and I, I love how you said, I even thinking back to the conferences where I heard you give this speech, you know, where you say, look, mm-hmm. he, he, would, he would multiply loaves for other people, but when it came to yeah. his own hunger, he didn't use his power on himself. And yeah. um, yeah, this is extraordinary in, like you said, in the history of real human beings, uh, but also mm-hmm. in the history of fictional human beings, right? The best literary characters dreamt up. Uh, nobody else is like that when it comes no to power. That's right. And it's the, the couple of famous sayings. Lord Acton said, power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Mm. Great men are almost always bad men. Abraham Lincoln said that nearly every man can withstand adversity, but if you want to test a man's character, give him power. Mm-hmm. And that's that's what screws people up. Mm-hmm. If uh, There are very few people who survive winning the lottery, mm-hmm. even. I'm, and I know there are. In fact, personally, no. know one couple that, that did really well with it. But a lot of people just have trouble with yeah. it. Jesus... For him, he wore it easily. It just kind of, you hardly even notice. Yeah. No, it's true. And he did, I mean, and and you talk about, like, I mean, winning the lottery gives you a certain amount of power financially, right? right? But not, like, Mm -hmm. uh, being able to control nature. (laughs) Right. (laughs) That's a different kind of power altogether, right? That's another level. (laughs) Yeah, raising people from the dead, controlling nature, uh, multiplying (laughs) loaves and fishes, turning water into wine, that... So 
that that kind of power is fascinating. And then, like you say, he mm-hmm. never used it for himself. He always used it for other people. So right. you, you've got this combination of all powerful and uh, others focused, which is mm-hmm. a, a really, and sadly, in in our experience, it's an odd combination <laughs> that doesn't okay. typically happen. Yeah, it doesn't. And that's really early on b- before I started looking at other things. That, that were so unique about Jesus. That was the one that grabbed me. Mm. And I remember talking with another apologist and saying that it was, you know, I've been a Christian long enough to know that it's doctrinally okay to worship Jesus. He Mm. is God. So, yeah, it's fine. But it's when I started thinking of what it would take to be that other-centered that I fell on my face and said, you are my God. Yeah, yeah. He, he is so much better than me. Yeah, absolutely. And well, it was a worship, and, and a lot of this study has been a worship experience for me. Hmm. Uh, just seeing, um, Jesus, the, the p- title of part one of the book is Greater Than You Knew, and um, I'm pretty confident that's true for a lot of readers, but boy, was it true for me. Yeah. He's greater than I knew. Yeah, well, and isn't that awesome when you're reading Scripture, or like you intentionally looking at it from a different angle, and then seeing yeah. stuff that's there that you hadn't seen throughout, you know, your history as a Christian? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, that's, that is so fun. And don't you think, like, if Christianity is true, which I'm convinced that it is, um, mm-hmm. isn't that the kind of thing you'd expect to happen, that you wouldn't exhaust the holy book, that you wouldn't come to a place where you could know it all, but you would continually be able to see different aspects of this great God that we serve. Yeah, I, I mean, that's not proof of Christianity, but it's sure. a, it's something you would predict to be true, and it were, and it does come true. I think it certainly supports the truth of the, of the Gospels, is that there's always more depth and richness in there. Yeah. Yep. So in uh, in the first part of the book, you know, when you when you talked about the first uh, the first portion of the book is called "Greater Than You Knew." What are some of these yeah. things about Jesus that uh, that kind of showed you that he was greater than you had previously thought? Not that you hadn't thought he was great; uh, you were convinced right. of Christianity's truth, but just new mm-hmm. things that you discovered or new ways of looking at things that you saw. Can you give us a few examples from those chapters about what uh, what were some of these things that that you you mind looking at Jesus from this different angle? Um, One was his use of authority. Mm. He, uh, he, when he spoke, for example, in the Sermon on the Mount, he'd never said, thus says the Lord. Okay. The prophets did more than 400 times. Mm. They were speaking as if the words of God, Jesus was speaking as if the words of God. Mm -hmm. They said, thus says the Lord. Jesus says, but I say to you, Mm. Uh, there is something there that, you know, the skeptics will tell you that the, the idea of Jesus' deity didn't show up in the Synoptic Gospels, the first three Gospels. Mm-hmm. And it only came along when the Gospel of John was written decades after them. Sure. And, and so it's, um, it, it wasn't part of Jesus' life. It was something that got invented for him later on. Mm-hmm. But no, it's right there. He's acting like God. He's acting like God when in, in the last of the Beatitudes where he says, blessed are you uh, when people revile you and curse you in my name, mm-hmm. for so they treated the prophets who were before you. Mm-hmm. He's comparing us to the prophets and himself to God. Yeah. He's putting, And he's saying we have the same blessing. <laughs> there are things like that. Right there in his first sermon, at least on Matthew's timeline, yeah, that are pointers towards his own deity and his own awareness of it. Mm-hmm. No, that's awesome because yeah, that argument that oh, it was a later developed legend that, that comes from John. You're saying no, right. in Matthew, in the yeah. first sermon we got, he's claiming <laughs> and he's he's right. uh, he's attributing these things to himself when he says, "I say mm-hmm. to you." Well, and he's he's yeah. contrasting the law, right? You heard what Moses said. But I'm mm-hmm. telling you, like, what audacity. Like, who would say that? <laughs> who would um, say that? Yeah. Who would get up in front of a crowd? I mean, imagine, you know, you're a pastor. You're, you're candidating to, to, 
to preach in a, in a new church because uh, mm-hmm. you just got fired here. Okay. No, because <laughs> no, um, you're candidating and, and you stand up and the first thing you say is maybe some some, you know, nice to see you greeting kinds of things. And then you say, uh, you, don't worry, folks, I haven't come here to abolish the Bible. I've come here to fulfill it. <laughs> yeah, I don't the think that'd audacity. go well. <laughs> I mean, first of all, who who's up in front of a crowd and the people are there are going, oh, my gosh, what if he abolishes the Bible? Yeah, yeah, that's, sure. That's not the reaction most of us would evoke in a crowd <laughs> no there was something all. about jesus that, that people would have thought huh, what's he doing here what's he doing to our old test to our uh to our tanakh mm-hmm. um they could see it in him and they were astonished it says at the end of that sermon the, the yeah. last couple of verses of matthew 7 yeah they were astonished because he spoke as one who had authority yeah different from other people and and again they'd already seen john the baptist right so yeah. he, he came in the line of kind of an Old Testament prophet type, and they're recognizing, no, this guy's different from that. Like <laughs> He's not the same as that guy yeah. was, which it's, is, is fascinating. Right. Yeah, that right. is such an interesting way to look at it, to talk about him mm-hmm. saying, I say to you, and, and giving this authority as if from God, right? Higher than, right. than Old Testament prophets. Right. Yeah. Well, what is something else that, that you saw to, that kind of pointed out in that section that he's greater than we've realized? Uh, th- this is the one that has surprised me. And if anyone listening to this podcast knows of an exception, I want to hear it. OK, because it's, it's actually disturbing to me if no one has noticed this before. It. it that where in the Bible does it say that Jesus had faith? Hmm. Nowhere. Hmm. Not once. In Hebrews, it says he was found faithful, but that's in the context where it's saying he was found to be reliable and obedient. Okay. There is nothing in the Gospels, nothing in the letters, nothing that says that Jesus had faith. And his other Virtues like love, compassion, obedience, those were mentioned. Okay. Paul's mentioned his own faith and said, imitate it. Mm-hmm. You would think that if Jesus wanted us to have faith, which he said even more often than he said he wanted us to have love, hmm. you would think that he would say, have faith like I have faith. Yeah. Yeah. That would, yeah. Isn't that's... that strange? It's not in there. And nobody's <laughs> talked about it as far as yeah. I know. Tell me if I'm wrong. Yeah, we're told to have faith all the time, but yeah, I, I I can't think of a passage where it talks about Jesus having like faith in God, right? It's right. it isn't in there, no. And and the only explanation I can come up that ex, that that makes that work is that he had a relationship with the Father that was so close that our word faith, describing our relationship with the Father, was the wrong word for it. Okay, and. It would be like saying, you know, I have faith that I could, well, okay, I could write this book. When I set out, I think, okay, I have faith in myself, I can do this. Mm-hmm. But there, in order to use that word, you have to have some point of like, yeah, but maybe not. Sure. You do not, if you're in normal health, say, I have faith that I can scratch my eyebrow. Yeah, I've never thought. Even I- though <laughs> it's true. Even though you can trust your ability to scratch your eyebrow. Yeah. You just don't use that word, and there's a. I think there's a sense in which it it would have been the wrong word. Okay. Just as it would have been the wrong word for Jesus to say, "Let's pray to our Father." Hmm. Uh, he never did. He was very careful to say it in the resurrection scene in the end of John. He said uh, to to the women, he said, "Go tell the disciples that I go to my God and their God and your God." to my father and your father. Hmm. He he kept that relationship different and distinct. Mm-hmm. He never said our father, except when he told the disciples that they should. Yeah, well, when he was telling them, them how to pray, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's including him, Jesus, in the same statement. He's saying, here's how you right. should pray, say our father. But So are you saying he, he's not equating his relationship with the father to be something similar with everyone else's right. relationship? Yeah, and so the analogy I use in the book um, comes from the, the Episcopal Church, where they, uh, where the church members will often call their priests father. Okay. But 
but they're not required to be celibate, so they might have kids. Hmm. And so this uh, this priest has a son, and the son has a friend, and the two kids want to go climb up in the church belfry. Mm -hmm. The uh, they could both call him father, but the one who is his son would not say, "Let's go ask our father." Sure. Yeah, that's that true. That would just be strange. Yeah, that's and a weird I think way to put it. <laughs> yeah, and so I think it's the same thing going on with Jesus. He just, yeah. God is our father. Jesus could say he's my father, but they just don't fit in the same context. And yeah. it, it would be strange to combine them that way. That is so great. And again, getting back to kind of your methodology, what are the things Jesus didn't do? Well, yeah. <laughs> he never said our father uh, and incorporated right. himself. He never says to have had faith in God. Um, that's fascinating. Mm-hmm. And those are big deals, right? I wonder why people haven't discovered these before. Like what, what, I know. I wish someone had, uh, and maybe someone, maybe maybe I will learn through this podcast or something that uh, that it has been discussed before. Maybe, or maybe you're the trailblazer, and now other people yeah. can really start digging into. Yeah, what is the deal with that? Because that is a really is odd yeah. thing. Yeah, it so, is. Yeah. So Jesus is a different type of character um, in using his power never for himself, but always for others, having extreme power that he doesn't use on himself, which none of us uh, would live like that. We're not that virtuous. Um, But then he also distinguishes himself by not attributing his relationship with God the Father to be the same as everyone else's and not saying or or ever asking for faith um, Mm -hmm. in God. Uh, Because Mm -hmm. what, what would you say with that one, like, why would they? Why would that be the case? Would would we just say that he he just knows? Like he, there's not a not a faith aspect, not a trust aspect to it because he just knows it to be the case. Yeah, that's my best way of explaining it, and okay. I think it does need explaining because faith faith is absolutely built on knowledge. It's mm-hmm. wrong to say that it's blind or that it's a, a leap without evidence. That's sure. a atheist trope. That's just wrong. So it's built on knowledge, but you don't use the word faith unless there's something at risk, something ventured, something that you can't control the outcome of, something where you don't know for sure. Mm-hmm. So we, we just don't. Um, and so I think probably what this is saying is that this relationship with the father was such that it was uh, that that this, these, those unknowns weren't there. Hmm. And and so. Even when he was struggling in the Garden of Gethsemane, it wasn't that it was an unknown. It was just, uh, I think, agonizing over what he knew, what he was going to experience. Mm, yeah. And um, he wasn't saying, okay, God, um, can we change our mind here? Mm-hmm. It, I don't think that's what he was saying. He was just making, a, at that point, a deeply human expression of agony and knowing what was coming. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I love, too, in your book how kind of going along those lines of Jesus knew what he was getting into. <clears throat> you talk about how, um, you know, uh, we, we can't choose to be born or not. Right. But Jesus is in a different category, uh, even, even in that, yeah. right? You want to explain that a little yeah. bit? Sure. Yeah, it's, it's like he chose to die for us. Mm-hmm. I mean, he really chose to die for us. You and I, we might choose to die for our uh, wife, our wife, or kids, or something. Sure, we might have a certain amount of choice there, but what we don't have a choice of is not to die at all. Mm. And Jesus did; he did not have to die. He did, did not even have to be born. Mm. And the thing that really cued me in on this, I saw this in the news a couple of years ago. It's just the most outrageous lawsuit ever. <laughs> this man in India filed suit against his parents for wrongful birth. What? He said, yeah, um, you shouldn't have had me born, and since you did, you're going to have to cons- compensate me. <laughs> um, of course, that part is a pretty common kid thing to say. Yeah, parents, you owe me. Sure. But <laughs> yeah, that's he, normal. He, it was wrongful birth, and it's kind of like, um, um, y- you should have given me a chance to give advanced informed consent. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, Jesus did. Yeah. Yeah, and Jesus he could have, right? In, yeah, informed consent. He de- yeah. he he came to be an infant, mm-hmm. knowing that was coming. 
Yeah. He came to be raised in a family, knowing that was coming. He came to minister. He came to be um, laughed at Mm -hmm. and then finally beaten, tortured, and executed. Man. Knowing that it all was coming. Yeah. And when you think about that, again, like, it just, it does make you want to worship the guy, right? Because you say, what great love yeah. would move you yeah. to do all of those things and to be mocked and to be beaten and to be crucified, to be laughed at, to be misunderstood, to not use your power on yourself, but always give it away to other people, only for humanity yeah. to kill you, your disciples to betray you and run from you. Why would you do that? It makes zero sense uh, unless you really are that great and your love for us is that immense. Um, and again, it, good theology it, it should sense. always make us uh, bow down in worship, right? And that's what I love about your book is I keep reading it. I'm going, man, Jesus is great. <laughs> and I, is, knew, yeah. I knew it, but so I know it more, you know? Yeah. He is. Yeah. It's, it is just amazing. Uh-huh. Um, the different thought, that kind of the paradigm shift a little in looking at the Gospels and what Jesus said and did. Um, again, I know I've said it on the podcast, but you got to get this book. It's it's a really great read, and it's a great uh, worship experience, to be honest. So getting into part two, which is kind of the namesake of the book, Tom, Too Good to be False. Here's where Mm -hmm. you kind of put forth a case for the historicity of the Gospels. But again, it is a different kind of argument than the typical Mm -hmm. you know, manuscript evidence or transmission. It's very different from those typical apologetics arguments. So can you kind of walk us through uh, why is Jesus too good to be false, and how does that help us understand that the Gospels are accurate depictions of things he really did? Sure. Yeah, one thing that's different about this is you can you can um, grasp this argument without knowing even, for example, that Jerusalem was destroyed in A.D. 70. Okay. That's an important fact for an awful lot of apologetics. You don't even need to know that much, even something mm-hmm. as simple, simple as that. Um, here's where it starts. It starts with, boy, are we talking simple. It starts with what we and the atheists can really easily agree on. It's a story. Yeah. We have a story. It has a main character. Mm-hmm. The story is told in four different interrelated versions. It's got one main character. Mm-hmm. And stories always come from somewhere. Yes. Stories have backstories. You have to, you want to have a story that makes sense in terms of its backstory or the other way around. Because um, if if you say we've, we've got this story, as I talk, tell in the book about a concert pianist and what it's like on the road. Mm-hmm. And you open up the fly leaf and it says it was written by uh, a pro hockey player from Calgary and his business manager. Something's not going to, you're just going to say, well, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah, something, sure. Something's, okay, I got to understand this differently. So the, the, the skeptics have a backstory and, and we have a backstory. Our backstory fits. Our backstory is that the reason the Gospels were written is because it's true reportage of a life that was really lived. Mm-hmm. And that fits the story. If if the backstory is true, the story makes sense. Okay. The, the skeptics have a backstory, too, which is that the—and this is the, the external knowledge you have to have in order to grasp this. You need to know what the skeptics say is the, the story by which this story was invented. Mm-hmm. Because it was invented, and it starts with a deep psychological need of this community of faith after their leader, Jesus, was executed. Mm -hmm. They invested everything in him, and he's gone. They're in incredible psychological distress. Oh, by the way, what I'm saying, not every skeptic would go with every detail here, but this is a general picture. Okay. So they're in this deep psychological distress. So they resolve it, and people actually do this. We have cases we know of where they'll invent a new reality to make them their their um, their trust in that person true after all. So they invented a resurrection. Hmm. And when people do that, they often proselytize it in order to reinforce their their looniness actually is what it is. Mm-hmm. And so they proselytized it. They spread the word and people picked it up and it spread all over the Roman Empire. Mm-hmm. But as it spread, it was by oral transmission. And 
and specifically the way Bart Ehrman, the, the chief proponent of this view, and uh, certainly the best selling, is the telephone game, mm-hmm. where you whisper in in the in the party game, you whisper the story uh, something into one child's ear, and then around the circle, each one whispering into the next person's ear. And he says, what happens to the stories as they go around the circle? Hmm. They change. Except he emphasizes that this is multiple languages, multiple cultures, all around the Mediterranean basin. Hmm. And he says, what happens to the stories? They change. Mm -hmm. Change? Oh, come on. They get screwed up. They get corrupted. They get distorted. They get (laughs) totally, yeah. And so... This is what he thinks is the the explanation for where the story came from. And, and he'll say there are plot points that show it, like we've got different numbers of angels at the tomb. Mm-hmm. And so that's a sign of how God distorted. And I look at it and I go, that's a twig in the forest. Hmm. The forest is the character of Jesus, who is so extraordinary, so different, so unique, so consistent, so unlike any other character in history, so unlike anything that Goethe, Shakespeare, Tolstoy, Sophocles, anybody ever invented. And you're saying that this telephone game did it? <laughs> yeah. That and takes a lot it, of faith and, to believe and that. did it so that it lands on the same character all four times. Yeah. How, exactly how could that be? Exactly the same character. Uh, that's just not conceivably true no how could a telephone game i don't think game the backstory fits the story yeah you throw out the backstory you can't throw out the story we've got it yes yeah. um, so where did it come as from? A, yeah so where did it come from i i can't um they change mm-hmm. yeah we got a different number of angels at the tomb he's too used to jesus too we're all too used to jesus we yeah. think we're so used to Jesus, we think that's an easy story to make up. Yeah, it it seems more like um, it, it would take, uh, again, like Frank Turk always says, you know, it would take more faith to believe that that's where these stories came from than they were just written by eyewitnesses <laughs> because that's what it occurred, was, right? How did they do that? Yeah. yeah. And Bart Ehrman's stuff is, is fascinating because he, he has to nitpick such, like you said, twigs, like really small minutia to find a so-called difference, and I don't think they are, right? But right. it's not like it's not like the main character of the story was a witch who was a woman in one gospel, and then it's Jesus in another gospel. They're right. not big differences at all. And so, yeah, how yeah. could how could first of all, how could anyone produce that great of a person, character wise, power wise? one time through a telephone game, but now he expects us to believe that it didn't happen once. It actually happened four times independently through development yeah. of legend. It's crazy, right? I mean, or even the, semi-independently, but sure, sure. and even the number two character, Peter is the same character. Yeah. Yeah. That's in right. all of them. It's, um, it's too consistent to be, to fit that way. And then to come up with the character of Jesus, um, this is where, uh, I really got a lot of help, and, and this is not original with me, but um, or at least it was uh, it was supported as I did further study by by old authors and okay. Philip Schaff, writing um, what 150 years ago, said that in this case, uh, if if they came up with Jesus, in this case the poets must be greater than the hero. Hmm. You you can't wow. it. it to come up with a character like Jesus, yeah, I, I don't think so. Yeah. Well, and they'd also not only have to be greater than the hero, but they'd also have to be very humble about writing about the greatest character ever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? Which, yeah. I don't no know kidding. if that yeah. fits, right? I just happened to make a—yeah, right. Um, and to come up with him as a, a, another uh, author, um, C.A. Rowe, talked about how— well, actually, several did, but about how Jesus, being both God and man, works in ways that I don't know how anybody could write it. You look at him in his trial, for example, and he is the human who is at trial and is about to die. And he's been through Gethsemane, and it was awful. Mm-hmm. And he is suffering the pain. 
But is there any moment in this trial or even his time on the cross when you when you think um, he's lost control, he's actually in charge of the whole thing mm-hmm. all the way through? Yeah. He's still God. He's still human. He's still God. And it's not like a little bit of each. No. He's just both. Mm. <laughs> That's a really cool little trick to play as a writer. I, yeah. Uh, I'm... I'm a writer. I don't think I could do that. Yeah. I know I couldn't. <laughs> but, yeah, <laughs> but Galilean uh, fishermen could, right? They could. That's yeah, right. that makes sense. They they could just sure. totally make something like that up. That they could that just fits. Do that. Sure, because that's those stories are easy. <laughs> yeah. Fascinating. Uh-uh. <laughs> well, when it gets down to um, this idea of uh, you say in your book, you know, Jesus no matter what, right? That's part mm-hmm. three of your book. Jesus, no right. matter what. So what yeah. What do you mean by that? Uh, what's What's that kind of about? And what's some pushback you get on that type of a, a, a da- audacious statement? Yeah, well, a couple of things. I think, first of all, putting it in context of where we are in Western culture, we're in a different day. The, the rest of the world maybe has, you wouldn't say this, certainly Christian history where um, but but for us, this is new. People, yeah, everywhere, even in America, have had to say, am I going to follow Jesus even though my relationships are falling apart? Mm. Or am I going to follow Jesus even though I lost my job? But now we're, many of us, being asked, am I going to follow Jesus even though following Jesus is the proximate cause of the pain? Mm. Where there's persecution, where uh, people are losing their livelihoods and the job, uh, and or being asked to uh, uh, give up their ethics on the job, and and what I want to say in this part of the book, after going through those the other two parts, is yeah, Jesus is worth it. Mm. He's we ha- he's worth following no matter what, mm. and it's Jesus alone. It's it's not like Jesus is a good option. Mm-hmm. Because if Jesus is a good option, then the cross is an option. Mm. And if the cross is an option, then the universe, let's say, has a list. And, you know, a list of ways that we can get right with the universe, where you can get right with God, you know, mm-hmm. whatever you want to call it. Yeah. And there's the Buddhist way and the Muslim way, you know, follow these fivefold path, eightfold path, whatever. And uh, or whatever you you like for your way, and so these are all nice ways to get right with the universe. And the and the trial, torture, and execution of Jesus is one of the nice ways we can get right with the universe. Mm-hmm. And I go, wait a second, that doesn't fit. <laughs> How doesn't it fit? The, what do you mean by that? What, what the doesn't cross fit? is not a good idea unless it's the only good idea. Hmm. The The torture and execution of the Son of God is a horrible idea unless it's the way and the only way that we could be reconciled to God, unless it's the expression of love that makes it possible for us so that Jesus could do it for the joy set before him, enduring the cross, despising its shame, and he did it. Not as plan A when there's a plan B, not as plan C when there's a plan D. He did it because this is the way to be reconciled to God. Mm. The cross cannot be optional, which means Jesus can't be optional. Which means if you've got a list and it's got three or four items on it, cross Jesus all the way off. Uh, or, Or say the list is very short. It's Jesus. <laughs> yeah. That's a powerful you, argument. You can't put Jesus on a list no. of ways to come to God. No. He Either he is truth it's or it's a terrible idea that none of us should believe because it's atrocious. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Man, that is a powerful statement. I love that. I love that idea. But that's what so many people try to do. And this is this is also fascinating to me is everybody mm-hmm. wants a piece of Jesus. Right. Yeah. Everyone incorporates him into their stuff, and and it's always puzzled me as to why is everybody like this guy? Like, what what is it about him that well, everybody they wants? His, they see his his magnificence, mm-hmm. his power, yeah. and they'll chop off the pieces of it that they like, and they'll incorporate it. Mm-hmm. Incorporate it. Craig Hazen is the one who tuned me into this one, and and he said, look, you know, if you're gonna, all, if everybody's gonna be interested in Jesus, and 
if you're going to research a religion, why don't you just start with him? Yeah, makes sense, it, right? It's the place to start, yeah. Yeah, you can kill a lot of birds with one stone if you just start on who is this Jesus guy because everybody right. wants him. No, it's interesting because like uh, – all the religions in the world, they don't try to incorporate Muhammad into their stuff or Buddha into their stuff. No, they don't. But everybody yeah. wants a piece of Jesus, which should make us go, I wonder what it is about that guy. <laughs> that makes everybody want him to be affiliated with their religion. It's fascinating. Yeah, and it doesn't even have to be a religion. They're socialist Jesus, too. Sure, that's right. So it just it's amazing, isn't it? It is amazing, yeah. I think it's probably because he's true and everyone deep down knows – that he's he's the right way, right? Very like Romans like one says, we all know deep down uh, that mm -hmm. God exists and that He's there. So that is that is awesome. Well, Tom, this has been uh, just a treat. I love this book. I love your arguments that I've heard you put forth uh, before. But what are, what is kind of you know summing up the book and and the big ideas of the book? What is something that you want to leave our listeners with? Oh boy, <laughs> uh, just. Get to know Jesus. Uh, try not to try, try to get past this idea of, of taking him for granted. Look for things in his life that that we really should see as being unexpected, and be confident in him. Be confident in him because the story, yeah, it's a story, but it's a true story. Mm -hmm. And follow him no matter what. Just don't let go of Jesus. Yeah, amen. That's so good. Uh, love for you guys, our listeners out there, to go and pick up Tom's book, Too Good to Be False, uh, How Jesus' Incomparable Character Reveals His Reality. And again, we'll have links in the show notes for that. But Tom, where else can people follow you and, and what you're doing and your writings? Where can they get more of you at? Sure. There's uh, there's two places. The the best place to to read a lot of what I write, where I write most often is at The Stream, where I'm a senior editor, yeah. and that's three to five articles a week, mm. typically. Stream.org, okay. just stream.org. And then uh, the blog, Thinking Christian, which is thinkingchristian.net, mm. which is oh, maybe once a week. And I'm doing a podcast, too, now nice. that I just, I have just, um, as of yesterday, Transition from being a longer podcast once a week to being a short one three time, two to three times a week. Oh, that's great. So, And you can find that at thinkingchristian.net also. That's great. Well, and at Thinking Christian, again, you have got a backlog of blogs that it's just yeah. a treasure trove of reading. So if you want to go out and you want to start getting into theology, apologetics, philosophy, Tom's website, thinkingchristian.net, is the place for you. And you can read to your heart's content <laughs> because there's a lot there and it's all really great stuff. Well, Tom, we have uh, really enjoyed having you on the show today. Thanks for taking time out to come and talk with us about uh, these insights, these, this different way of looking at Jesus. It's just refreshing for me to hear. Uh, it's inspiring. And like you said, when you see these things, it makes you just want to worship Jesus more and more. We knew he was great, but wow, yeah. he's really great, right? I, I know right. it at a different depth, which is so mm -hmm. refreshing to my soul uh, as a believer. So I really thank you, brother, for writing this book and for uh, blessing, honestly, blessing the Christian community with your mind and your study. Uh, it's just been a, a real encouragement to me and honestly to, to the people that I've taught. And uh, so, yeah, just really thankful for, for who you are and what you're doing with your ministry. Well, I thank the Lord. I, um, I have no other place to attribute it to except for to his grace and um i just appreciate the chance to talk with you too this is, this is fun yeah. This, so. <laughs> yeah this is fun so. i know it's it's fun because we're talking about ideas that i've written down but it's yeah. it's just fun to, to interact with a brother absolutely well hey we'll have you on again sometime soon probably you know when your next book comes out or something so <laughs> we'll see yeah. yep well, thanks for being with us today, Tom. And thank you, our viewers and our listeners, for being with us today on Christ, Culture, and Coffee. Again, if you can leave us a review or rating on Apple Podcasts, that would really help us out with getting more notoriety so we can reach more people with these amazing truths about our amazing Savior. Also, if you're watching on YouTube, if you would subscribe to our channel to help us just to continue to grow so we can impact more people, we would really appreciate that. We'll be back next week with another episode of Christ, Culture, and Coffee, and we will see you guys then.